So um, as I was saying, welcome to this uh, this training session. I decided to call it Ringing Oddities, but I'd just like to make it very, very clear at the start that when I say Ringing Oddities, I'm not going to give a talk about some of the uh, eccentric bell ringers of the past or anything like that. Um, the main focus uh, of this talk is on um, methods um, and maybe a, a few little things about, about towers as well and that sort of stuff. Um, so we're going to look at a few strange things that have been uh, rung in the past. Um, thinking a bit about naming of methods, but also things that ringers have uh, done that, that they shouldn't have been doing in towers uh, in terms of, of methods. Um, thinking about tricky methods, difficult things, uh, odd things that people have chosen to ring, basically. So it's a, a series of, of uh, peculiar methods that have been rung in the past, basically. Um, one of the things, uh, ideas behind this is that perhaps when we uh, gradually emerge into um, the world of practice nights being allowed again, it might give you a few ideas for things you might want to, to have a go at, though obviously some of these are uh, and not things you'd want to have a go at necessarily, but uh, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. I thought we'd uh, start with strange names, and that's that's a title that I've chosen deliberately. Um, there are, at the moment, as things stand, 22,390 methods on composition library. Um, anyone who's at the talk I gave about how methods work um, might recall that um, that number is actually, although that sounds like a lot of methods and we'd never dream of learning all of them and having them all in our heads at once, um, that number actually is only scratching the surface of the number of methods that could be run. Um, and I think in that talk, I said something like there are more uh, six bell methods or seven or eight bell methods, can't quite remember, um, possible than there are atoms in the observable universe, according to uh, Mark Davis, a very clever man who I asked that question to um, back in the spring. Um, so there are lots and lots of potential methods. And it's not surprising, therefore, that uh, with 22,000 methods and many, many more that could be run, that Bellring has started to quickly run out of sensible things to call their methods, I suppose, um, and started to uh, look for um, ways of naming their methods that would be interesting. So one thing that's that's happened that uh, is quite fun, I think, is that uh, method naming has started to go into sort of realms of um, organizing them thematically. So there are methods named after each month of the year and people can try to uh, tick off um, quarter peels or a touch of each of those methods in, in each given month. Um, but lots of other sorts of themes as well. There's a set of methods named after mythical creatures like the Gorgon and Hydra and uh, those sorts of things. There's a set of methods named after uh, subatomic particles in what's known as the particles peel, which actually will come up in two of the next uh, sections that I'm going to talk about. Um, one of those method names, uh, along with top, up, down, um, charm, meson, uh, is strange. So there's actually a method called strange. What an odd, strange method name. Um, people have tried to be amusing with their method names. I think it's rather bad taste, but there is a principle called Titanic sinks, um, possibly a little bit in bad taste, um, and various others. There was one rung as a, a band in Devon that have been working their way through rude place names of Britain, um, like Scratchy Bottom and that sort of thing. Um, but they also rang a method called Brexit Derangement Syndrome, which I think one method member of the band wanted to be disassociated from that particular appeal after they published it uh, with that particular method name. Um, and so on. So if you ever invent a method of your, of your own, do think carefully about what you're going to call it. Um, perhaps, and this is quite a popular option, name it after, as we're all, uh, as we are bell ringers, uh, name it after a type of beer or a pub. There's a set of methods named after pubs in York, um, lots of methods like black sheep um, and others that are, are named after, after beers. 
Um, so yeah, do look out for strangely named methods and some of those will probably come up uh, during the rest of this talk. Um, now the next part I thought we'd, we'd look at is um, what I, I'm calling it illegal moves, but um, they're actually not illegal anymore. Um, what used to happen is that the Central Council Method Committee had rules over what methods could or could not be run. Um, and some of these rules were quite tightly defined, which meant that um, certain methods ended up being described technically as uh, not, not methods or as illegal methods. Um, and one of the ways in which um, bell ringers before the Central Council changed their system for, for method naming, um, one of the things that bell ringers could do to break the Central Council rules uh, was ring methods with jump changes. Um, this uh, that method that I've put here uh, is jump Stedman doubles. Um, and just to quickly outline for, for everyone's benefit how Stedman broadly works. These first couple of changes are the same. Um, Stedman is divided into blocks of six changes. That's why we've got rows of, of six, six rows of uh, changes kind of divided up with these lines. Normal Stedman has what we call quick sixes, quick blocks of quick sixes and blocks of slow sixes. Um, this one here is a normal, no it's not, this one here, sorry, uh, this one starting four, two, five, three, one is a normal um, slow six and in a slow six, it's basically these front three bells are ringing, effectively ringing plain hunt. Um, and the two bells here are doing a double dodge. Um, and there's two types of six. One is where uh, the leading here is backstroke, then handstroke. And one is where the leading is handstroke and then backstroke. Um, in this version, you add two other types of six, two different blocks of changes, uh, where some bells jump more than one place and this is why it was described as a, an illegal move. Uh, in this six we'll see just here if you look at the four which is in thirds place at the start first change here at hand stroke it then jumps two places down into lead a backstroke and then on the next change the two jumps down to lead at hand stroke and the three jumps down the next time and the other two bells just move up uh, in parallel. So the four follows the two twice here and again here, but a place higher. Um, and this must be quite, I've never rung it, but it must be a little bit confusing to ring because bells be uh, kind of appearing and changing in ways that you really wouldn't expect. In this type of six, the bells are jumping up, so which is probably a little bit easier to execute um, than jumping down, I would have thought. You just hold the bell on the balance and wait rather than having to pull it in. Um, yeah, they're jumping up two places. So they're skipping the kind of normal thing that uh, ringers tend to do of changing one place at a time. Um, and by doing this, you actually get a full uh, extent. So 120 changes. Normal Stedman doubles uh, is half an extent, 60 changes. Um, but by introducing these two other types of uh, six with the jumping around um, you get you get a full extent all of the possible changes that you can ring on five bells um, I think that would be quite hard to ring because the, the blue line doesn't really work for this method does it you'd have kind of normal blue line and then a very sharp switch uh, down and then a bit more normal blue line and another sharp switch down uh, and so on, and bits of normal Stedman broken up with bits of jumping all over the place. I mean, not jumping all over the place, only within those three changes on the front. But uh, I think this is quite a quite an interesting one to um, maybe consider having a go at once uh, once we're practicing again. Uh, so jump Stedman doubles. Don't know whether you'd find it anywhere online other than uh, a couple of places that I'll show you later. Um, one of the things that changed with the Central Council relatively recently is that they decided to stop um, having rules over what you can and can't ring. 
and instead try to focus on describing what has been wrong. So moving from, I think they called it, moving from a uh, proscriptive to a descriptive format. So saying, saying this is what's been wrong and not really casting judgment on whether it's uh, a legal or illegal move anymore. So actually, jump, step and doubles is no longer the illegal controversial method that it once was. Um, the next illegal um, move, though, I'm not quite sure what its status is. This is one that is that can't be found on Composition Library, that remains a, a niche area and mysterious area of, of ringing. Uh, and it's called Dixon's Bob Minor. It's actually quite old. It was um, rung, being rung in Victorian times, and there's a peel board somewhere with um, a description of a band ringing this method in 1863. So it's been around for quite a long time. But the reason that the Central Council felt that this wasn't a proper method um, is that it doesn't, is that it kind of isn't. Um, so it, it doesn't have a um, regular structure to it. Most methods, um, if we think about something like plain bob, for example, have a bell that's doing something fixed, so a hunt bell, usually the treble, going up to the back, coming back down to the front, and the other bells doing a, a pattern of work where they all do um, something, um, you know, they all do the same sort of thing at some point in, in the method. So you know, treble goes up to the back, comes down to the front, leads, a bell makes seconds, and the other bell dodge in plain bob. So a kind of clear structure and uh, a, a symmetry to it and, and those sorts of things. Um, Dixon's is a purely rule-based method. And if you want to develop your band's listening skills, this would certainly um, provide a challenge on that front. So purely rule-based. Everybody rings plain hunt is the first rule, except that any time the treble is leading, like in plain bob, um, uh, a bell makes seconds and the bells above seconds do a dodge. So people, first thing people would have to do is work out and listen for where the treble is and um, when it's leading, a bell would make seconds and the other bells would do a dodge. But the additional challenge is that when two or four are leading, um, a bell makes fourths. Um, this means that, as we'll see, the the position of the treble changes in quite random and unpredictable ways. So in this first section, uh, if we just look at these changes that I, I wrote out this morning, and I hope I got them right, uh, two goes into lead, so starting like plain hunt, two, one, four, three, six, five, two goes into lead, and then a bell makes fourths, um, whichever bell happens to be in fourth place here at handstroke stays there in fourths at backstroke. This means that these two bells, five and six, do a dodge, treble comes up, four comes down. Now the next section here, four is leading at handstroke, leads again at backstroke. As a result, a bell has to make fourths. That's the treble, four, three, two, one, five and six do another dodge. And then the treble comes back down to lead. So this is quite a short lead, a bit like um, something like Little Bob. Um, but in a normal method, if the treble was the hunt bell and it had gone to fourths and then was coming down, then this point here would be a sort of point of symmetry. So we've had fourths here. If it's symmetrical, we'd have fourths here again. But because uh, it's not two or four that's leading, we don't. We have some more hunting. The treble leads, the bell makes seconds, and there's a dodge. But if we look at this next block of changes, we'll see that because here three, six, and five are in the lead, all of this bit is just plain hunting. There's no dodging, there's no fourths or seconds being made. Everyone's just ringing plain hunt. And the treble gets all the way up to the back this time rather than stopping in fourths. And because the two is the next bell to lead, a bell makes fourths, the treble does a dodge on the back, gets stuck at the back. The next change, the forward lead, the treble gets stuck at the back again. So the, the second lead of the method is significantly longer than the first one. Uh, and so it's quite unpredictable. And if you have calls um, when the treble's leading, so like a, a bob, uh, it gets even more unpredictable. And it kind of effectively has to be rung purely by listening out for when two, four, or one are leading, 
and then following a rule based on uh, based on the position of those bells. Um, so really hard to ring, I, I think. I think I've rung it once um, on on handbells ages ago, but it, it was hard. Um, and yeah, this would be a, a challenge, I think, for uh, for any band to uh, to try to get to grips with. Appeal of it has been rung, but that appeal uh, obviously was kind of uh, you know, uh, denied by the Central Council as being a valid appeal. Um, on the topic of illegal moves and appeals, actually, there was one rung in Cambridge. I can't remember the, the date, but we'll have a look at it a bit later. Um, a few years ago, where they tried to rang a six bell appeal, where every extent broke a different rule um, set by the Central Council. So they had some jump changes. I think they might have run an extent of Dixon's. Um, and some other things like that to uh, to wind up the people of the Central Council, I think. So illegal moves, if you want some interesting and uh, sort of uh, rule breaking method ringing, then jump changes or Dixon's Bob Minor could be the thing for you. Okay, um, I, I entitled the next section, the next big thing, dot, dot, dot. Um, and I'll explain what I meant by that. Um, in sort of the late 18th and then into the 19th century, one of the things that bell ringers seemed to be very keen to do was try to find what we call the next big thing. They knew that Stedman was a really uh, popular and regularly rung principle um, where all the bells do the same um, work at some point in 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 the uh, in the method so you don't have like a regular hunt bell um and they were looking i think for something that they could put their name to and be immortalized in the same way that fabian stedman had been for inventing inventing stedman uh the man on this slide is not mr duffield uh he didn't name a method after himself uh that's Sir arthur percival haywood uh, a um, famous ringer of the 19th century uh, who invented this principle, uh, I imagine thinking and hoping that it would be um, the next big thing and that it would be just as popular as Stedman. It's actually quite a quite an interesting um, structure, the way that it works, and an interesting blue line. So it's divided into little blocks of, uh, of changes, um, blocks of six changes, same as, uh, same as Stedman actually, with but with double dodging at the front and at the back, and then plain hunting in this middle uh, section here in the middle four, four bells. So some double dodging either side and then some plain hunting in the middle. Uh, and it's actually, it looks, you know, it's actually really rather musical. There's five, six, seven, eight coming up off the front um, and eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, back round. Uh, and a four three two one eight seven six five, which would be quite nice. Do, 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 do. Um, but it's not been rung as much as I imagine Sir Arthur Percival Haywood was hoping. Um, I had a look on Bellport and found that uh, they they have I think forty eight performances of Duffield, and that's major major royal and I think there's a Maximus version, um, and that goes right back to. Um, around, well, there's some from the 1800s, not all of the Victorian performances are on there, but, um, you know, it's not been rung perhaps as much as uh, he had hoped, but maybe it's due a renaissance. Um, the other interesting thing about it is it's never been rung to appeal on handbells, despite having first been rung in the 1800s, uh, which is probably something of a, of a record, I would have thought. Uh, the other person to try to come up with uh, the next big thing, and he did name his method after himself, uh, was a chap called William Shipway. And what he was looking to do was try to extend Stedman um, onto, onto eight bells, onto, onto major. Um, so to do that, what he did was he extended the um, number of bells that work together on the front to four bells. Um, and he increased the length of time that they were there to eight changes rather than six. Um, so Shipway works with a triple dodge rather than a double dodge uh, in each position in seven, eight and in five, six. And then if we, if you know Stedman, you probably recognize this bit of a bell going into lead, going in quick, uh, we call it in Stedman, and coming out again. 
And then some bits of this might look familiar as well. You might see a Steadman whole turn here and some point blows here, but the bells are going up to fourths and coming back from fourths uh, in between those bits of work um, and then stuck on the front. Now, this is sadly even less of a success than, than Duffield. And um, when I looked on Bellport, I could only find seven reports of performances of Shipway Major unfortunately. So again, a, um, I think um, William Shipway died in the 1840s, but probably composed this method pre-Victorian times, but a, a 19th century uh, miss rather than a hit, perhaps, sadly. I think it's quite hard to, to ring, if I understand correctly. Appeal of it was rung uh, in Ashdead a few years ago, and there's an article about it in The Ringing World, which is worth looking up if you get a chance. Um, the other person who was really into principles was uh, a guy called John Carter, uh, who did all sorts of great things for ringing, um, one of which probably isn't Carter triples, um, which looks like an extremely difficult method to ring. We've got uh, this interesting point, third, point lead, thirds, point fifths, thirds, point fifths, thirds, point lead, thirds, six, point fifths, and that thing. Um, it does have a nice symmetry point to it, though. We can see this kind of, that's quite a nice little bit of line there. Um, but again, an attempt to try to uh, come up with the next big thing in, uh, in the 19th century. Um, sadly, only three performances of Carter Triples on, on Bellboard at, as things currently stand. So if you're looking for uh, something unusual to ring on eight, then this could definitely be described as unusual given how, uh, how little it's uh, being run. Right, the next part, I thought we'd have a look at some, um, some real challenges and some uh, crazy lines. And to do that, I'm going to uh, switch over to Composition Library to have a look at um, the blue lines as they, as they, uh, as they are on, on here. Um, if you haven't used Composition Library before, it's a really amazing resource and I'd encourage you to sign up. It's not just for compositions, it's got method details as well and all sorts of uh, really good and interesting search features. Um, so this is a method called Scientific Triples, which um, was first run in, according to this, 1958 uh, and is uh, very well known to be very very difficult one of the things that makes it very difficult apart from the fact that there's very little obvious structure to it so it's just a case of sort of learning the line and sticking to it is that there are several different types of call that put you into uh, funny places on the line and require you to do different things depending on where on the line you are um, amazingly recently down in the uh, Australia, um, the Perrins family rang a peal of this on handbells, um, which I think is only the second time it's been rung on handbells, and I think is the, the, the very definition of a serious lockdown project, I think, uh, getting your family to uh, work out uh, how to ring scientific triples on handbells. Um, and this one's also from the same sort of stable of um, methods invented in the 19th century. Um, again, not rung very much, but actually is, uh, when it is rung, that's, uh, that, yeah, it's not rung very much because it's hard, not so much because it's uh, unpopular, <laughs> um, really. But yes, yeah, scientific triples, a real challenge. Now, talking about real challenges and crazy blue lines, uh, I think the next method that we, get, we should look at uh, is one that was first rung in 1981 uh, to appeal in Hampshire. Um, and has not been rung since. And if we look at it, we'll probably see why. It's a method called double Darabi, surprise major. Um, and that looks like a lot of a lot of blue line, but if I just scroll down, we'll um, see that actually there's really a very great deal. We're halfway through it now. Very great deal of blue line to this particular method. The reason for that is that um, unlike normal surprise major methods where the treble does a dodge in, does one dodge in one, two, and another dodge in three, four, and another single dodge in five, six, and one more in seven, eight. This one, the treble does 11 dodges in each position. 
Um, and the effect of that is to create some quite extraordinary bits of work. For example, if we look at the blue line here, just coming into lead and then dodging up, that up dodge from here through to here is a 25 pull dodge. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of other lengthy bits of, uh, of work, 12 pull dodge there. Um, and so on, and all these 11 pull dodges with the treble. The plain course of this method is actually a quarter peel. Um, it's 1344, uh, so 1344 changes long uh, and covers the whole length of a quarter peel. Uh, and getting the peel uh, composition was extremely complicated um, because of uh, the fact that the treble's dodging in every place uh, 11 times, creating uh, basically difficulties for the composer that, that are too complicated to go into now. But an extraordinarily long blue line and a hard one to learn. However, um, that is not the longest plain course or the hardest blue line. The next method, invented in the 1990s, I believe, uh, and rung once on tower bells and once on hand bells, uh, is called double helix differential major. And the plain course of this method is 1,680 changes long. Um, and each section, each of these, these blocks has a very long, is a very long section with little discernible uh, and easily followed structure. Um, I don't really know how the, uh, how this was rung on handbells and the, the yeah, it, it must have taken an extreme amount of learning to get the hang of, of this, a lot of rote learning of, of where the bells are meeting and that sort of thing. Double helix differential major, a crazy method that has been rung very uh, infrequently. Um, just thinking about other weird things that people have rung. I mentioned earlier the, um, the particles peel with methods named after uh, the subatomic particles, top, up, down, strange, charm, meson. Um, this is meson maximus, um, which fits in with several categories, actually. One for having uh, a quite kind of, well, there is an obvious structure to it, but it's quite hard to, to follow if you're ringing it just by a blue line. So this is one of those methods where looking instead at this sort of structure and looking at how pairs of bells work together um, is easier than trying to learn a blue line, a bit like you couldn't learn a blue line for Dixons. But it's also uh, fits in with this talk because when this was first rung, along with most of the particles methods, uh, it was initially described as illegal by the Central Council. Uh, and the reason for that is that there's um, what's called falseness in the plain course, there are some repeated changes if you ring a plain course of it. Um, when it's rung in the peel composition, it doesn't create falseness because of how it's kind of placed in among the other methods. But if you rang a plain course of it, you'd repeat some changes. And so when it was first rung, the central council were like, no, you can't ring that, that's not allowed. Um, and yeah, it's an interesting example, as I say, of how it's sometimes easier to think about how the method is structured than trying to follow all these random different blue lines which are doing funny things. One final one on method structure is this method called Poppadom uh, and again fits in several categories, a, an amusing name. Um, it was first rung in a uh, peel where we rang Poppadom first for uh, about 700 changes and then switched into Yorkshire Royal. So we decided to describe it as uh, uh, call it poppadom because it's like a, a little sort of starter at the beginning of the main uh, meal. Um, and this one follows a principle, it looks for very kind of complicated, follows a principle which uh, is vaguely described as it's called winking up, um, which is where you take a method on five bells and you turn it into a royal method by getting um, pairs of bells, basically, to do bits of work that would kind of duplicate the, the blue line on, on five. Uh, so if you sort of 
that's that's not very well explained but if you kind of step back from it and squint at the screen a little bit you might start to see what i'm talking about if i say so this coming up here to the back is like if you look at the two lines is like coming out quick in stedman doubles and these steps back are like a double dodge and that's like lying behind and then here is like coming in slow and that's a whole turn and that's a half turn and thirds is taking a doubles method and making it into a big 10 bell method and i yeah I, this is one where you have to sort of take a step back and squint at it but the basic rule is if you would move a place uh, from first place to second place that's from one two to three four then you ring hunting on four and if you're going to stay put in a place in the, your normal blue line you do a double dodge um, and that's how Stedman doubles gets turned into a method called poppadom. Um, okay I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint and just show you a few links to some further resources. Um, I mentioned about uh, Duffield, Royal, and uh, methods like that today. If we go to uh, over to here, um, if you want to read more about Duffield, the Whiting Society has this incredible collection of old ringing books um, that are available for free on their website, loads of them from famous ringers of the past. And um, in an effort to uh, popularize his method. So A.P. Haywood wrote a book about it um, and then kind of distributed it among the, the ringers of Victorian England uh, in an effort to, yeah, an effort to get Duffield popular. Um, if you want to find out more about illegal methods, the place to, to go to have a look uh, almost certainly would be um, the website of Philip Iris, who's got um, a section about illegal minor methods. Uh, and a page about um, Dixon's minor um, and another page which I would have talked about if we'd had time about method symmetry uh, and it's quite complicated but it's an interesting thing to have a look at if you get a chance and get uh, get bored any time in the next couple of weeks. He also wrote uh, an interesting selection of articles about kind of about compositions, but it includes some details on uh, things like Jump Stedman um, and on uh, other doubles methods and other methods that you might want to ring. Um, if you're looking for some amusing things to ring on small numbers of bells, socially distanced for Sunday service or something like that in the new year, uh, then this collection of uh, miniature methods, including the nicely named shipping forecast, could be the place to go for some small, uh, small methods. And this article in the learning curve has some uh, things about Erin and about Shipway and about how those methods um, work. So that's a tour of some crazy uh, methods and ringing oddities. Uh, we've got a bit of time for questions, um, but I'm going to stop the recording uh, now.